the next thing you know, I've I've attacked someone and they've killed me and I've like disconnected or something and I lost it and my mum remembers this day for the like until she dies of me just absolutely just weeping. And my mum's like, You lost what? <laughs> Adam and trimmed and she's like cor- like consoling me and and she has no idea what I've lost. But I'm so sorry for I was me, laughing it meant so much. <laughs> Joe presents games for the end of the world together with Lynx. Hi, I'm Tom Deacon and welcome to another episode of Games for the End of the World together with Lynx. Now, as you very well know, the apocalypse is absolutely raging outside, but do not panic. Do not fear. I am well down here in my bunker and it's very snug and the, uh, the it's warm. That's why it's a good thing. Now, listen, joining me this week, I am joined by a fantastic guest, a professional gamer and esports presenter. It's the one and only Mr. Matt Gallagher. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> you did it well, considering there's an apocalypse. How are you finding it? Is it is it going as you thought it would do? Is it better than you thought? Worse than you thought? Um, well, considering no F1 races can actually happen now because mm. of this, yeah, uh, it's a little bit. I don't really know what I'm doing because F1 is literally all I've got. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm with you. So that's al- always a good start. It's a perfect start. Um, and, and the bunker's a safe place to hang maybe out. We have underground racing. We could do uh, maybe a scale electrics, or we might just game. That would be beautiful. Now, listen, Matt. Uh, for those who haven't followed your journey in WTF one, how would you summarise what you do? You say F one's your world, it's your life. To put it into context for people, what is it that you actually do? Who is Matt Gallagher? What does he do? Uh, so, I guess on the face of it, I'm the WTF one presenter. So, um, two and a half years of, of basically heading up the YouTube channel with ideas and. Uh, sort of creating content once a week twice a week depends on if it's a race week or not um so yeah basically just fronting the youtube channel doing all the all the good stuff on there uh doing bits and bobs f1 esports with you you know lots of little things uh happening as well but for me it's it's at this stage yeah it's kind of just uh making sure we get out as much f1 content funny content because that's kind of what wtf one's all about is not just reporting news and that sort of stuff we we like to have fun with the drivers we like to have fun with just uh any guests that we have or we play games or you know it's it's a lot of uh it's not the worst job in the world let's put it that way yeah and, and they sort of say on on the site the world's fastest growing audience who are loving uh f1 or, and motorsport in yeah. general and are you finding that at the moment yeah, I mean, it's been a, a whirlwind the last two and a half years. It's been absolutely crazy to think, you know, we've gone from literally zero two and a half years ago when they've approached me and gone, Matt, we want to do this YouTube channel. We don't really know how it's going to go, or what it's going to look like. Uh, and now we've got four, over 400,000 followers on, on YouTube and, and it's kind of just spread across the social channels as well. Mm. So I think the, the F1 community needed something like us, which is just fresh, unique uh, although I say unique, everyone seems to be cottoning on and what we're doing and they're like, how do we do this? Yeah, how uh, do I make it myself? Yeah, I've, yeah. Got, I've got a camera phone. I can do that. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. It's not as easy as that. I mean, you're the king of memes as well when it comes to your social media. I, I, I want to cover everything. As soon as we've got this time, uh, seeing as the apocalypse is raging on. Um, but first of all, let's get in there. First question, you know, who out of the gaming characters that there, there's a whole plethora of them, who would you have to help you in that apocalypse if there was one that you could pick? In the apocalypse itself, uh, probably Master Chief, uh, purely because I've played Halo. That was probably one of the games that really grabbed me uh, back in the day. And uh, and Master Chief is just an absolute badass. So, I mean, he he literally has the world falling apart around him and, and, and manages to jump onto ships and you know, thousands of meters worth of... Uh, Still crack on. Yeah. Even though he's probably not getting paid overtime. <laughs> but he's saving the world, so... There's, surely there's got to be a price to that, though, isn't there? So something... Oh, thanks for the gift. The book vouchers. What am I going to do with these? <laughs> yeah, when there's no shops because yeah. it's, it's the apocalypse. But he'd be very helpful. I think he would. I don't know if he'd speak very much. I don't think he'd be a very good companion uh, to chat to. But as long as he keeps me alive, I don't really mind. Yeah, I suppose. Like, there's not the emotional connection uh, that you're going to have. But maybe you can find that from, I don't know, growing a plant or something <laughs> in the apocalypse. Do you know Master Chief personally? Is that No. It's like that Matt Damon film where he's in Mars <laughs> and he's just growing stuff and then it all goes wrong and you think, I feel like that's what it would be like at the yeah. apocalypse. Okay, all right, I'll take your word for it. Okay. Uh, listen, <laughs> Matt, uh, so much I want to get into to chat to you. You've already highlighted we've worked together on F1 Esports. I want to talk about that. Uh, by the way, just anything you want to highlight from the bunker so far that you've, you've noticed? Shower? Uh, shower, yeah. That, that's that, You have to be pretty short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you just crouch. <laughs> yeah. 
under yeah. the N64, or yeah. do we move that? And if you don't want to, well, yeah, you, we can move that. I, I do move that. Um, I just tidied up actually for you, so that's Did rude. You? Oh. Uh, but uh, obviously, there's loads of links, so you don't actually need to have a shower because you can just, yeah, just in case you do bump into a lady <laughs> again down here. Pu- yeah, down here. <laughs> yeah. That's not. I haven't seen many. <laughs> no. And I think that's the one thing I miss. Just, just someone to chat to. Well, I'm here now, so mm. we can chat. Yeah. All right then, let's do it. All right, Matt Gallagher, yes. early life. By the way, I'm loving the Control Freak T-shirt. Yeah, That's I thought it fit in quite well. Obviously, I didn't have much time to get ready when because the apocalypse and I had to find a place to stay. But yeah. uh, I thought this was probably about right for what we'd be chatting about. Okay. Um, if you're listening uh, on the podcast, uh, just watch it on the video on YouTube, and then you can see the T-shirt. <laughs> That's what we're so listen, <laughs> uh, early life. I want to go back because obviously we we know where Matt Gallagher's got to in terms of the WTF one. They approached you and said we want to do something on YouTube. Now I know that you created your own YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So I want to get to that. But before that, as I ask every guest that comes down to the bunker, uh, those early gaming memories, who got you into gaming when you had something like a Mega Drive or an N64? So who, who was that person that, that led you down that gaming path? Well, it was my dad. And I think my dad got quite a lot of stick from my mum because of the amount of time I would sit there playing games completely and utterly just absorbed by this incredible machine that's in front of me. Uh, I think that's probably where my competitive spirit came as well. You know, I wanted to play against my dad when I was like six. And I was like, right, come on, I want to I wanna battle you. I want to do whatever we're doing. And, and you know, it got to a stage where my dad was like, you're beating me. So I, I, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I've retired. <laughs> yeah. What was, it? was there a particular iconic game that your dad was into that then said, Matt, try this. Come and join me on this. Uh, my dad was, was really into a game called Command and Conquer. And, <sighs> and he, he really got me into that. Because I, I remember just kind of watching him over his shoulder and going, I want a piece of that. You yeah. know, can you come off the computer now so I can play? You know, because it was you didn't have two computers in the house, so yeah. I had to watch. But um, but yeah, I think you know, a few years down the line, I had my own little laptop, which you know would take about a year to load the game, and because Command and Conquer was quite an intensive game as well. But yeah. my God, that game was just I awesome. Just, I just remember it being Command and Conquer Red Alert. Done, yar. Do this mission. <laughs> like dogs. And Yuri as well. The expansion pack was. Of course. Uh, but there was allies versus the the the, the red army the soviets, soviets yeah and but for me that i i was so hooked on that game because it would shoot to like um or just cut to like an anime like, welcome comrade <laughs> welcome to the room and you would go over and you'd be like oh this is so immersive yeah 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 but because it's an rts game it's a real-time strategy game is that what appealed to you and like oh you could chat to your dad about where to 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 attack and you could come up with strategies like as a team as you mentioned about the whole campaign side of things, that was really immersive. Even though when you look at it now, you just go, okay, this is not really <laughs> what you'd be expecting in 2019. But um, I think back then, just having those consequences of your actions, so you blow up something and then you have that, that movie clip and yeah. you're like, oh God, I've just really annoyed this this Soviet man. you know. And uh, But in terms of what me and my dad used to do, you know, it was it was more me going, please, can we play multiplayer? Please, I want to play against you. I need to beat you. And him going, I'm playing the campaign, leave me alone because I don't want to lose to you. So he's one of those sort of gamers then. Yeah, he was a solo. I can't be dealing with all these 12-year-olds online that are beating it. <laughs> him, me included. Uh, whereas I think, again, that's where my competitive spirit was always like, I need to prove that I am better than whoever else is playing this game. Yeah. It's really quite healthy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But I suppose that's the beauty of that gaming when you... It's, uh, I played against my dad on certain games Games that you'd link up once you had two computers it was like game changer you could compete against each other um but uh but, but once the d- internet actually did the dial-up tone and da, 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 da. <laughs> dun, dun. we'll play any minute in the next <laughs> half an hour we may or may not be able to link these computers did, did you still game now your dad uh occasionally i think he, lo- he, he he casually mentions to me sometimes oh i played command and conquer the other day i'm like oh cool yeah. that is cool but i don't really play it that much anymore because <laughs> I don't have time for it. <laughs> I, I just like the idea that your dad still hasn't completed the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Many years He's on. still stuck on the third mission. Yeah. <laughs> and there'll just be a new wave of 12. Well, there won't be, actually. They'll have got older because no one's picking that game up. No. I remember selling it at a car boot sale and talking of real-time strategy. I had, it. I sold it, yes. And remember the games came in a big box that were like, if you got yeah. it just right, it'd be like, it'd be like a fart noise <laughs> as the box would <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right so that would lift up and you get one cd box in there so it was unnecessary how big this box was and i had a couple of the command and conquer uh games and a guy came along put them all together and went, i'll give you five pounds and i was like uh, yeah and he, he real-time strategied me yeah, he, completely i sold was, it for a fiver and i was you that's it yeah i know um so all right uh so you mentioned your mum was not so keen on you 
being so immersed? Is that because you would just get so absorbed by the game and then there really wasn't an outside world anymore? Yeah, I think, you know, I think so many hours into the games, you know, especially when it's around school time, you know, going into secondary school and, and I'm still loving games. Um, yeah, I think obviously back then, you know, esports and this kind of YouTube, all that sort of stuff didn't exist. There was no career that you could get out of games. Nice. I hadn't shown any sort of creativeness to be able to create my own game. Yeah. It was just, I like playing games. So yeah. there wasn't much a sort of, I can understand. I can understand why she would have been like, get off and just do some homework or, yeah. you know, or revision. Oh my goodness, mate. You know, go yeah. do an hour revision and I'm just there like, okay. Yeah, but who's going to defeat the Soviets if I don't do it? Exactly. Um, what other games were there? If there wasn't like the Command and Conquer, Red Alert, what other games were you playing? On your own, not with your dad, obviously, it's solo <laughs> campaign only. Um, well, I mean, really early days was like Super Bomberman. That was an wow. absolute worldie of a game. Yeah. I loved that game so much. Um, and and uh, sort of going through the years now, I, mean, I used to play sort of Duke Nukem and that sort of stuff as well. Oh. I mean, what a game that was. Uh, GoldenEye, you know. Did, did you play it with your parents and put the parental guide on? Uh, the... Oh, absolutely not. I didn't even tell them that it existed. Oh, my so... word. I had it for such a long time where Duke Nukem was like, shake it. <laughs> and it, it would, it would, there would be no one there. <laughs> like, shake it. That was the parental guide, was it? It just yeah. deletes, the... <laughs> deletes the, the women that would be dancing. And like. he would come down into because there was there were several different ones you could play where you started on the top of a, a building and then yeah. you're in the cinema, the old cinema. Yes, yeah. Nothing would be happening. No, no gore <laughs> would be happening. He'd be like, shake it. And I'd be like, I don't understand this. Whereas it's not that, years later. I guess I realized... nowadays there was like sensitive content where they would delete the whole level, wouldn't they? Like in yeah. Call of Duty or whatever. If you don't want it, they just delete the whole thing. But I didn't realize they just got rid of the graphics. Yeah. That's incredible. Um. So, so Duke Nukem, uh, were you playing co-op? Was it multiplayer? You were sort of, uh, yeah, or just solo? Yeah, just solo stuff for Duke Nukem, but um, sort of moving to I think, oh, I think I was about twelve years old when I discovered RuneScape, and and yeah. I th- some of my friends were playing. Oh, have you heard of this? I was like, RuneScape, what what is this game? Yeah. Um, and then they kind of told me about it, showed showed me it. I remember going around my friend's house a few times, and next thing you know, I am I am I am absolutely sold. So what so what happens in this game in RuneScape? What what happens? So it's a role playing game. Um, it's similar to World of Warcraft in a lot of ways, but it was. I guess at the kind of same time as the classic World of Warcraft. Mm. Um, but yeah, you'd have like 20 odd skills that you would like level up depending if you want to do woodcutting or if you wanted to fight, yeah. you'd have loads of different skills. Um, and, and I just, like the fact that I could continually get better was something that my brain was like, I need to be the best. So that, that that really brought out that competitive element. Mm. And you, I suppose you could explain to your mum, you know, look, I'm, I'm woodcutting now. I know the fundamental <laughs> levels of woodcutting. <laughs> Genuinely, my mum would walk past and go, are you still cutting trees? <laughs> Why don't you go outside and do something like that? And I'm like, well, I don't get levels in real life. <laughs> you don't get levels in real life. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, she just never understood, you know, or I'd have my trimmed armour. I remember one time I was probably a year or two into playing it. I'd got my adamant. It was it was known as, I think it was the second best armour at the time, and it was trimmed in gold. Wow. And I was walking around in the wilderness. <laughs> And you, you, could be kill- about. you could be killed in the wilderness and uh, I'm walking around thinking I'm absolutely, you know, Billy Big Balls. <laughs> and next thing you know, I've, I've attacked someone and they've killed me and I've like disconnected or something and I lost it. And my mum remembers this day for the, like until she dies of me <laughs> just absolutely just weeping. And my mum's like, you lost what? <laughs> Adam and trimmed. And she's like, cor- like consoling me and, and she has no idea what I've lost. But I'm so sorry. I was me, laughing. So much. <laughs> You're laughing about it now though no <coughs> no absolutely not okay just trying to try to, um, your mum frantically calling around friends going, Matt's what is lost an adamant, an adamant. <laughs> he's lost an adamant he's adamant I... he's lost adamant <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that was that beauty that you would dedicate that time but it was so in a moment it could all be lost and yeah. I know for a fact you playing uh, FIFA you've lost uh You've, you've raged, uh, which we'll get to. So, all right, so you're, you're playing these games. Obviously, you had mates that were into games as well. Uh, so what what took you to that next level where you start thinking, actually, I'm going to now put myself on YouTube. I'm going to start streaming, essentially. I mean, the game that changed for me and pretty much changed my whole life was F1 2010 because yeah. that was the first game that came out on the Xbox 360. Um, and it was actually in a mainstream console and you could play against people. There was the multiplayer option. Uh, and I was playing it, and obviously I've played F1 games all my life, pretty much. So I, I, I'm, I picked it up quite quickly. I was quite good, you know. I'd be high up on the time trial leaderboards and stuff, and I'd be racing against people and winning quite easily because mm. I guess that was the first F1 game to come out, so people were still getting used to it all. Uh, and then I thought to myself, let's 
let's try this YouTube thing. Because uh, I saw that some of my friends had started doing it. They'd got like 50 subscribers. And I was like, whoa, whoa yeah, yeah. 50 people watching you. I want I want a piece of that. But before you get down to that, like, were you were you into F1 anyway? Yeah. So so did you feel like that gave you that skill element that you knew, uh, you know, with the, with understeer, whatever the technical terms yeah, yeah, of yeah. like going around corners, you would say, I've got this. I know the, the fundamentals of it. Like if you would pick up FIFA, you know football because sure. you watch it. Did, was that what you were finding with F1 then? Uh, it's it's difficult to say. I think the amount of time I put into F1 2010 to get good was because of my passion for Formula One and watching it since I was about four years old. So, you know, my dad just plonking me in front of a TV and, you know, wow. Because he loved F1, so he I always sat there watching it with him and then yeah. <clears throat> I got taken by it. And then 15 years later, whatever, F1 2010 came out and I was absolutely hooked. So you on the Xbox, was that you have your own wheel or just on the control? Just controller, controller, just controller. And that was what I was kind of known for in the F1 community as being this really fast controller player. Because gotcha. back then, you know, there were wheel players and, and there's always a debate, oh, which, which is quicker, controller or wheel? You know, much like the debate between PC and console players, like yeah, you know, yeah. PC players are better. Whereas it's like wheel versus controller, what's fair, what's not. What voice are you doing when you do that? Cause it, it's like a Twitter voice. That's, that's what I kind of call it. It's like the social media the kind of whining. <laughs> whining, <laughs> complaining about something. Yes. So you're on that. How many hours you put it into that Xbox 360 uh, playing the, the F1? Well, I'm glad it wasn't measured. Um, yeah. But... I don't know, because uh, obviously back then I was doing, I think I was having a part-time job. I mean, I say part, yeah, it was part, it was very part-time, yeah. but uh, maybe four or five hours. Like, per it, day? Depend, it depended. I might have a day where I wouldn't play at all, and then another day I'd play six hours. You know, gotcha, it, was, yeah. it was very much, you know, sporadic. But um, when I was in, I was in for the long haul. And, and, and the main reason I did play was because of the, the league racing as well. So the competitive side and that, where I'd sign up to this, to this, uh, this league called Apex, or well, it was called Apex Racing League. Yeah. back then it's now called apex online racing and uh and we'd race every sunday night well, it was wednesday and then it moved to sunday and yeah. i would prepare i would train you know i'd That's be there amazing. getting ready for australia you know i'd be tra training days beforehand to get as quick as possible and uh yeah when you're talking training are you are you learning the techniques are you googling are you sort of going online to find how you commit because that's the beauty of f1 is it's a constant grind you are constantly can i shave off 0.2 of a second yeah. can i do this is that what you were is that the level you were going to yeah absolutely uh, googling probably wasn't so much in f1 2010 because it was the first game so everyone yeah. was figuring out all these setups you know you've got eight or nine different parts of the car that you can change in terms of the ride height the suspension the the tire pressures everything so you'd be testing out loads of different mm variations of the setup to see if it fits the track and yeah. that that's a lot of time that can that can go as i found because it's gone <laughs> you can't get that back <laughs> no so you were worth it so in that league were you mic'd up were you chatting to the other drivers yeah yeah so we'd be on the headset um in game chat because i think we'd be told to go in game chat because if there's an incident you'd usually try and sort it out on the track like oh if you punted him off you just let him back through or you know that sort of stuff really um but most of the time you know i'd be i'd be out in front or somewhere near the front and if i had some sort of controversial incident i'd be coming over the microphone going what are you doing you know yeah. i'd be i'd be straight there even if it was my fault I, I would still be questioning it and uh almost psychological games going on so yeah uh but so you mentioned a part-time job. I'm just trying to p picture mm. it in my head. Yeah. You're doing this on a Wednesday, got moved to the Sunday. That's fine. Not much happens on a Sunday anyway. Uh, F1 races, but sure. <laughs> I know. What you, but, you know, it's, it's not just the Sunday, Matt. It's yeah, the yeah. whole build-up as well, which is very important. <laughs> yeah. um, but so you're doing that. You're doing a part-time job. Were other mates in your life, like maybe at your school or college, were going, you're playing a lot of this. Were they not like... They're trying to get you out from that F1 world or they, the people you immersed yourself with into it as well. And in terms of people thinking, Matt, I know you're really good at this, mm. <laughs> but what about career side? Were they, were they not jogging you or nudging you to, to go down that path a little bit? It, it's difficult. I think I, my mum, definitely, you know, yeah. she was like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. I won my race on Sunday. Yeah. What, what does that mean? You know, I'd come down the stairs all smug again. All right. You know, Sunday night, yeah. not half nine. It's just finished. Won my race, mum. Yeah. She's like, cool. <laughs> what is that achieving yeah. nothing but in terms of you know i would see my friends and and i i had the dream back then that i wanted to be a teacher and so i, I kind of had a a little bit of a sort of route yeah. yeah and and this was obviously seen as very fun but also i wanted i wanted to win that more than i did want to focus on studies or anything at that point but um yeah i, I it was it was a difficult time in terms of actually knowing where i was going 
Uh, but you know, if I'm seventeen, eighteen, you're allowed to be like that and yeah. not really know where you're going. And my mum's like, it'll be a phase. You know, he'll, he'll get over it. You know, because I, I think that's how that's how it's changed. You 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 alluded to that. It feels like back then, this is a phase. It'll either die out or someone will just pull the plug on it, and then the real world has to happen. Yeah. Whereas now there are careers in it, so that passion that you had. You had like a fallback plan. Yeah, I could do teaching, but this is what I'm working to put mm. it, it. It didn't offer you a financial uh, gain. It's no. just that pure competitive element from you. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's mad to think now that we have things like esports and F1 esports. You know, back when I was racing, I was like, this would be amazing if we could do like a proper competitive thing rather than just a Sunday night. And I always knew that there was room for it, but yeah. it, was, it, it was just a bit too early. Um, but, but yeah, so I went into from... Uh, sort of my part-time job I then went into a youth youth worker job for three years and still playing my game still do, starting mm. my YouTube channel which you kind of alluded to so I did yeah. my own personal YouTube channel uh, which has some uh, <laughs> questionable content on it but um, you know that that was just me finding my feet and you know I, I remember the day I hit a thousand subscribers and it was the best day of my life I was like that's four figures that's awesome people man. are watching me and yeah. and yeah and from there it just grew from strength to strength so you're you, at YouTube or at YouTube, not the offices, but you're you're creating content for YouTube for you to to put out there for the world. You're having fun with it. You just said you were made redundant from it from the youth work you were yeah. doing. So you gave more time and energy to it. What happened then in terms of taking you to was it WTF one that contacted you because they'd seen your content? Yeah. Because a lot of people will be gaming thinking if I just put myself out there, people will see me yeah. and see what I'm about. Is it, I know you didn't necessarily have that thought, but is that what happened? Yeah, I was going to say, I did not think that in terms of, oh, someone will look at this content and go, I would love to hire him because most of it was swearing or me just losing the plot. But at the same time, I was kind of like, you know, some of my stuff was very serious. I used to do like comment commentating over races, yeah. uh, not just on my own channel, but on other people's channels, trying to get my name out there. Um, and yeah, as you, you know, when I got made redundant for three months, I, I then decided, right, let's, let's try this for real, yeah. go full time. And uh, and then yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's a funny story how uh, WTF One uh, found me. So I was I remember I was in bed probably about ten a.m. You know, full time YouTuber life. Sure. And uh, <laughs> and I've seen the news that Nico Rosberg has retired from Formula One, yeah. like completely out of the blue, most manic news. I remember running downstairs, grabbing this rubbish camera that I used for vlogging, yeah. stuck it on the kitchen shelf. Didn't do any planning to talk about what I didn't. I didn't think oh, I'm going to research this, get the facts. Right. No, I just, I just turned it on, pressed record, and then ranted into this camera for about seven minutes. Were you upset that he was retiring, or, or you I was, shocked? I was angry uh, because I thought he was just running away from Formula One after winning his F1 World Title, yeah. which this video got a lot of stick. It was kind of like 50-50. Some were yeah. like, "Yeah, fair play," and others were like, "Matt, what are you talking about?" Yeah, but yeah. that was the beauty of my content. It was just purely un unfiltered this is what I think. Yeah. And, um, and so anyway, so I, I called Ro uh, Rosberg a few questionable phrases. Yeah. And um, that video is what the guys at WTF1 saw and went, he's the one, he's the presenter that we need for our YouTube channel. That's amazing how that just came about from your just one moment of sheer creativity, put it out there, Yeah. see what happens. Yeah, because a lot of people say, oh, you're so lucky to be in your job. Uh, but but they don't really understand where it all came from and because I put maybe three four hundred videos up on my old channel yeah. and you know that's a lot of time that would go into editing and I wouldn't be seeing much monetary benefit from it no. it was purely just for passion and at some point I, I kind of transitioned from hobby to okay this could go somewhere you know I'd get invited to a, a sponsored event or something I wouldn't be paid to be there but oh my god I'm getting a passenger lap in a car you know and then you think okay this this actually has some legs yeah and next thing you know uh that you know they've messaged me <laughs> it's quite funny actually so tommy the founder of wtf1 he dm'd me and yeah. said hey matt because i i knew wtf1 at the time and thought these guys are awesome yeah and he messaged me i was like matt we've got this secret thing coming up and we're really interested to speak to you about it can you come into london and i replied within 10 seconds and this is a <laughs> twitter dm <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> Uh, and they noticed that as well. Yeah, <laughs> I right. just saw it and went, yes, absolutely. Where, where would you like me in? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I didn't play it even cool, know... play it cool, yeah, play it cool. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know it was a presenter job or anything, but I was yeah. like, oh, it's so WTF1. Yes. Uh, next thing you know, you know, uh, they told me about the plans. It was all very sort of covered at that point. You couldn't tell anyone. Uh, yeah. And then it, it just turned into, right, Matt, yeah, let's let's do it. But there wasn't, any, you didn't set yourself a path to, I want to be a presenter, but yet 
when you're doing YouTube, you do become a presenter because you're presenting who you are mm. whilst gaming. Did, did the presenting at any point take over from your gaming? gaming was it side. more about the presenting than the gaming? Did you notice the change? Yeah, it was the hardest transition of my life because obviously I'm so used to sitting in front of a, a computer with a microphone shouting at gameplay. That's all I, I, I don't have any training. I've never been trained to be a presenter or any sort of thing like that. And I remember they brought me on for a test shoot at Birmingham. Uh, it was a, a motorsport show that they have there. Yeah. And it was my test shoot. It was my, like the biggest like day of my life. This was whether or not they're going to take me on as presenter. Yeah. And uh, I have actually watched this content back. And my God. Talk me through it. What happened? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what schoolboy uh, errors of presenting? Uh, Number one, did you did swaying? You do... Swaying. I was. I was. <laughs> I was. I'd, it looked like I'd had a few drinks. I was kind of swaying from side to side, talking about the cars, because uh, they got me to do sort of small segments. And then they said to me, "Right, Matt, there's Clive Chapman over there." I'm, I'm thinking in my head, "Who? Who's Clive Chapman?" Yeah. Uh, he's he's a, a guy from Lotus back in the '60s. Um, well, sorry, the son of uh, Colin Chapman. Sorry, the, the Lotus, the very famous Lotus Forty Nine, all this stuff. And that, right, we're going to get you to interview him. Yeah. About all these cars. No prep, just no prep. thrown in. Just we're going to interview him. Going to talk about his cars. And yeah. <laughs> I ha I love Formula One, but I'm not a history Formula One guy, so no. I don't have any information going into this apart from generic Formula One stuff. And my goodness me, just watching that interview back, I, I did not know where to put my hands. <laughs> that was the one thing I remember stood there. Just not just on going, him. Just not on do, him. Do just, just not on <laughs> him. Because <laughs> I'm standing up. And to be fair, it is a difficult thing that your brain's going, I look stupid right now. <laughs> but when you look it back, some of the, so, I mean, I'm, I'm holding here. I'm going here. I'm going there. <laughs> I'm, I'm up here. I'm going, please <laughs> help me. <laughs> Beam me up. <laughs> and yeah, and. <laughs> just watching it back I'm like why did they hire me but they they saw the the, the roughness of me and, but they also saw the potential yeah and, and uh, they obviously took me on I passed probation and I'm safe <laughs> so yeah it was it was a uh, honestly the the most heart wrenching because I, I thought I'd ruined it because yeah. I genuinely was like oh, I've, I've been rubbish I've done a few good takes for this that and the other but I thought I had to be perfect in terms of people who are gaming and they want to because now you're a pioneer, people will try and follow your path. And that may or may not work out for them. However, as long as they're having fun and they're making content, then they're having fun. That's 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 what life's all about. You know, life's hard sometimes. Yeah. So it keeps you going. So how what would you recommend to people who are now picking up, say, uh, F119? Or mm. what would you say to them in terms of that content they're making? Well, I get a lot of messages. Of, uh, to essentially make a career, I think is what I'm trying, yeah, to, trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, And I get a lot of messages asking me similar questions to this. Like, man, I've just started a YouTube channel. What's your advice? And it's so difficult to say, because it's like the generic, oh, you just have fun with it. Yeah. You know, have fun with it and the subscribers will come. Which, to be fair, is, is very true. Because if you look at my content back in the day, I was just having fun. Yeah. And making content that was felt natural to me. And then uploading it. I didn't have a huge amount of views, but I would put videos out and I would get, a sort of loyal fan base i'd be able to then start doing twitch streams i think it's don't get disheartened as well and, and try and network with people because mm. i wouldn't have grown anywhere near the amount i did on my personal channel had i not networked with arav tm at marduk other f1 youtubers that are, were mm. big in the game and we made amazing content together it's not like i used them we, we made a, an amazing youtuber championship which is still called to this day to be brought back mm. uh, and it's things like that where you just got you've got to think of it as a small little business it's your own business how am i going to get my name out there it's not just uploading youtube um videos i remember the first time i was uploading my first x matty g's driving school that was my first ever yeah. series <laughs> the editing on that is <laughs> something to behold yeah um I, I made that the intro black and white when i was just dry it was it looks awful but um it I, I remember going to forum after forum after forum after forum messaging going check out my driving school like making out posts I, I posted everywhere just trying to get 10 views 15 yeah, yeah. views and I think at a certain point maybe a thousand subscribers you can then start to snowball a little bit more but mm. you've just got to put in the effort you can't expect YouTube to be like oh it's the algorithm that's broken I'm doing yeah. the Twitter voice again <laughs> <laughs> but you can't blame other things for your you not getting success because yeah. that's just that's just going to be a negative thing and you and you won't get anywhere. You say the graft, the the effort, the time you have to put in. If someone is now picking up F1 2019, they're yeah. picking it up, they know F1 Esports exists, they now know that there could be potentially a career in it. Uh, I mean, we've 
seen since the first F1 Esports, the Pro Series, going out to Abu Dhabi uh, to watch the final, to then the next year it comes back. Now the F1 teams have come on board. Now yeah. all of the F1 teams are involved and they've got an Esports arm to their to their franchise, I guess. Uh, what can they do? I suppose it's just the graph, the time they need to dedicate to the game, like you did back when you were playing your racing championships on a, on a yeah, Sunday yeah, and a yeah. Wednesday. I guess you've got to learn pretty soon whether or not you're going to be able to qualify. And I think you'll know that as soon as you, you pick up the game, whether you have the natural talent to be up there. You know, Obviously, you're not going to be top 1% when you, as soon as you pick up the game. But there's obviously there's content opportunities, not just from getting to esports, but also making content around F1 esports. I don't see much of it. I have a friend, mm -hmm. Alex Gillen, who made a, a video about how hard is F1 esports to qualify for. I think it was back in 2018. Mm. That's got 2 million views, wow. uh, which is mental because you... Because, because, because I suppose people are now saying, what is F1 Esports? And he's right there at the, yeah. at the tipping point. But I mean, surely there's not, you say natural talent, but you might really love F1. You might just be a little bit bad positioning when you're, yeah, when yeah. you've bought a wheel, you spent a thousand pounds, one of your videos, a thousand pounds over a hundred thousand uh, sim yes. and rigs. But surely you can just keep grinding and get better at something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you can, if you have the time, like I did back in the day, and your mum or dad's not going to give you too much stick for it, and you have an excuse now, or esports, you know? Yeah. At least they have something tangible to go, okay, you're trying to achieve that, I'll give you till this time to see if you can do it. But if you have the time, definitely try it. I think it's going to get harder and harder as the years go on, purely because there's going to be more and more people yeah. trying to qualify, and, and it's going to get more and more saturated. But I think, yeah, but I'd, I wouldn't say don't try it, because it's a very tangible thing to see. It's For F1 esports, you go into a scenario mode, you do your races and then you see exactly where you stack up and then you can even learn from YouTube because I know the best guys put it up on YouTube and they post their runs yeah. for you to learn. So it, it's definitely a, a learning curve because there's tricks that you will never know until you actually research it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, I think it was Singapore or, or Malaysia. We were watching one of the particular races at F1 Esports and they'd gone from wets to super dry or whatever they'd done just to get extra grip and you're like working out the psychology of it. But if there was a number, and I know this is, it seems a bit, um, a bit of a hindrance when you put a certain amount of hours mm. that an F1 esports driver will be putting in is there a rough figure how much they'll be putting in I don't want to put people mm. off but I want them to understand this is the amount of dedication someone like Brendan Lee who's won yeah. two titles the hours he's putting in compared to someone who enjoys the game but yeah. they probably won't notice they're putting that many hours in they're just loving it yeah, yeah exactly it's a case of that you have to love what you do uh, my friend Harry Jacks he's known as Noble2909 he was part of the first and second F1 eSports series. Mm. And he had the love, because I used to race him back when I was 17, 18, and he had the love for it then. But when he found when he got to F1 eSports, he just didn't have that extra bit of passion mm. to be able to then grind. Because Brendan Lee, you know, he's won two F1 eSports titles, and he's put, he, uh, 14, 15 hours a day, he would make an entire day of it. You know, mm. he'd get up at 9, 10 a.m. and finish at 11, 11 p.m., that, I mean, mm. that's the kind of um, amount of hours you have to put in to find the extra tenth. You might think to yourself, I'm only a second off the top, guys. But it's finding that last second, mm. which is harder than the second you've just found. Mm. Uh, so it, it has it, you need so much dedication to be at the top of any eSport. Yeah. It's not just F1. You know, I can only imagine what the League of Legends players and those guys put in because yeah. they're always scrimming, as they call it, and, and practicing. So and then, and then after all that grind that you're putting in, you just turn the wrong corner, make a mistake, boom. I mean, that, if you that... turn the wrong corner, you haven't put enough. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's obviously... You can't go backwards, though, in an F1 car. But that's uh, why you see so many uh, guys so upset at the end of a, of a show, because they've put in all this time, and then they get hit by someone, yeah. or they, they you know, t not take the wrong corner, but, you know, yeah. they don't take the corner perfectly, and they clip their front wing. It's just a millisecond can change it in F1 esports. I think that's the beauty of it because in other F1 esports, you can make a mistake and in COD, all right, I died in that round, but I'll come back in the next one stronger. You you get clipped in the race. You are done for that entire race. I know. I feel bad now that sometimes I go, oh, chin up. See you next month. <laughs> yeah. They don't like that. Esports in general, everyone says there's loads of money in uh, yeah. esports do you, do you, and, and it's going to take off and it's going to keep growing. Uh, would you agree with that? What's your sort of standing on that? I think if you look for the past few years, it's it's been growing in the money figures wise. It mm. is it is getting bigger, and if you look at how many people buy games in the world, 
esports is only going to go up. That's how mm. I see it anyway, until it maybe becomes too corporate and maybe the fun is sucked out of it, which I don't think it will do because it's working. You know, you, you look at these League of Legends esports tournaments and they're selling out tens of thousands of seats in an, in an arena for the world, uh, mm. the world finals that they have. It's, it's frightening. It's, it's yeah. mad to see that so many people can get involved with it. And I think it's just that understanding especially when it's the F1 and the motorsport side of things. It's the understanding that it is fun to watch, yeah. even though you maybe don't have the risk that the motorsport fans want to see in, in real life stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I think esports is is still on the rise and it will be. And that's what excites me about the future for, for my career and is to see where it's going to go because... You know, as long as it's here to stay, I, I, I might be able to hang on. <laughs> have, I still have a job. Were you, are you a little bit sad that you weren't of that era where you could have potentially been uh, a professional esports player? I don't think I had the mentality for it. No. I think uh, I, I probably had the speed, uh, but I maybe didn't have the consistency and or the ability not, not to the, swear. Yeah, not the, <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, we hear a lot of F1 esports <laughs> when true. they're doing their qualifying. <laughs> um, listen, Matt, uh, I, I lied about that. We've got plenty of time. We haven't actually. Okay. I've got other guests coming in. Um, so um, listen. <laughs> Down the ladder, yeah? <laughs> yeah, oh, pretty right, much. Cool. But you'd be surprised. You could get quite a few people. <laughs> anyway, uh, Matt, listen, um, I, I, I want to know. There's one final question. Um, if there's one game that you could play for the rest of your days with the apocalypse, if there's just one game you could choose uh, from your career in gaming, what game would that be? RuneScape. Purely yeah. because it has the longevity. Yeah. I think uh, a game like Formula One and stuff, I could get to a certain level, but then there's not much left. Whereas RuneScape, I can start again. I'm a fresh character. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Well, listen, I'm glad you've chosen that because, you know, um, if you picked uh, RuneScape and as the game that you could play for the rest of your days um, in the bunker. Well, you see, the thing is, as you will notice from here, Lynx uh, keeps you chill under pressure so i'm going to ask you as many questions as i can on ruinscape in 60 seconds to see if you can stay cool calm and collected i've say- played this game for a long time yeah and wait until i ask the questions because oh. i've not played it so i don't necessarily know the pronunciations for some of these names i need to beat two don't i to not yeah. be, just to not be last because okay. if, you, if you can beat at the moment michael dacker uh, is at the top with eight I'm and a half this is the link's most chill leaderboard and that's what basic links does put that on you can stay cool calm and collected okay. i won't make you put it on just yet because I, I need it but yeah Okay, uh, so you're going to get 60 seconds, you understand? Try and get as many as you can. Sure. Okay. Oh, All right, here we go then. Three, Matt Gallagher, two, your time one, starts begin. now. Uh, when was the original game released? Oh, oh 2001. <laughs> Correct. Uh, it holds the Guinness World Record for largest MMORPG. How many user accounts have been created? Brackets to the nearest 10 million. Whew, 20 million. Ooh, no. Uh, it's 200 million. Uh, what's the name oh. of the world where RuneScape takes place? Oh, uh, Gillenor. Correct. Uh, how many ages have there been since the discovery of Gillenor? How many what? Ages have there been since the discovery Eight. of Gillenor? Six. Uh, what is the name of the skill that allows players to take more damage without dying? Hit points. Wait, defense. No, constitution. <laughs> oh, uh, no, it is hit, that is hit points. They changed the name. Which three skills can level up higher than 99? Oh, attack, strength, and defense. I've got dungeoneering, slayer, and invention. Oh, my God. These, okay. these questions. <laughs> Which people created? Uh, uh, Demonheim? Heim? Diamondheim? Dun- Dunno. Okay. Uh, okay, who committed the drainer bank robbery? Oh, my God. What are these questions? No, I don't know. Trainer man. <laughs> Wise old man. Uh, Amadil is the god of what? War. Fine. That's fine, mate. It's justice. Literally, all those questions. I thought they would be, like, simple, but they're not. No, they're not simple. And they're wrong. (laughs) They're simple and they're wrong. All right, so you're saying... I was wrong. So you... Uh, the questions are wrong. The, the Which levels, one would you like to say? The levels. Mate, there's been an uh, you apocalypse. Can, you can definitely get to 100. Do you know how difficult it is to print these? <laughs> yeah. There's been an apocalypse, mate. I think I got two, didn't I? Did I get two? Or three? Uh, one, two. Yeah, two. So, oh, do you know what? Geez. Hey, the thing is, that's great. Because, look, got Chris Stark here. Uh, Matty Gallagher. Let me write this down. Uh, Matt, M-A, double T, Gallagher. See, it would have been better if you'd given me F1 questions. Would it? Maybe not. <laughs> That would have been more embarrassing had I got them wrong. So, uh, two. I mean, look, listen. It can't even go to an adjudicator. I'll put you above Chris Stark. Does that Thank make you. Feel you. Yeah, that, that's great. There's a little gap. That's Appreciate beautiful, it. isn't it? What a what a leaderboard. Yeah. Yep. Two is go. about what I expected. So yeah. 
Well, listen, you haven't played for a long time, apparently. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're still trying to get over the adamant. Uh, Matt, uh, thank you so much for coming down to the bunker. No Have you enjoyed reliving some of those memories? Uh, it, now you walk away, are you going to get back on a game immediately? Uh, maybe not right now, but right. Uh, but yeah, uh, maybe I'll have to go back on RuneScape and see if I can learn who did the drainer bank robbery. Yeah, it's the, the old, wise, old man. wise old man. Well, Please. listen, Matt, thank you so much for joining uh, no myself uh, somebody in the games for the end of the world together with Lynx. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, we'll be back next time. But in the meantime, this is Matt Gallagher. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, give us a like, uh, follow us, uh, subscribe, do all of the things that made Matt Gallagher very successful. Does that, does that sound nice? Nice enough. Yeah, it was weird a I'll bit. Take it. I'll take it. Thanks. All right, thanks for watching. You have been watching Games for the End of the World on Joe, together with Lynx.